My name is Martin Newman, and I'm the Consumer Champion. After 37 years in consumer-facing industries, believe me, I have seen it all. My goal is to play a role in providing consumers with a voice, to connect with brands that they've engaged with, and to help companies to learn from their customers where they're going right or where they're going wrong. You're joining me on Customer Centricity, the podcast. Each episode, you will find me in conversation with leading business people, discussing some of the key issues around how to empower positive change for consumers and brands. Before I introduce our guest for this episode, let me tell you a little bit more about customer service action. Just like you, I've been on the wrong end of some staggeringly bad customer service. We've all experienced it, haven't we? Whether it's the root waiter or having to wait 40 minutes in a queue. And just like you again, I've also been delighted by an amazing experience when I wasn't expecting it. But aside from telling the manager or writing a rather awkward thank you note on TripAdvisor, what can you really do when something is great or when it's not so good? My frustration has always been not knowing how to raise these issues with the brand in question in the first place, or whether in fact I'd be even wasting my time by doing so. For these reasons, I launched Customer Service Action, a platform where people can share their good and their bad customer service stories and experiences in one impartial place. My vision is that we can collectively make a difference and create the change that consumers seek and in turn help businesses too. Good customer service and good customer experience leads to successful brands. So please visit us at www.customerserviceaction.com to learn more. Thank you for listening to Customer Centricity. And now for our guest. Today, I am absolutely honored and privileged to be joined by Sir John Timpson. Uh, Sir John, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast this morning. It's my pleasure. Um, yours is a business, I don't know whether you know this or not, but yours is a business that I talk about frequently. Um, I've written <clears throat> a couple of books about customer experience, and Timson is a, is a case study in both of them. Uh, I also deliver a, a mini MBA in customer centricity online, and I talk a lot about you know your business, the values, the culture of the of the of the company. I think I'm right in saying um, your great grandfather William Timpson opened a, a shoe shop in 1865. Is that right? That's correct. I mean, getting the dates absolutely right. In 1865, he opened a shop with uh, with his uh, his uncle, and oh. uh, then uh, four years later, he decided he'd rather do one on his own, and that mm. that was really the start of the Timpson business. So yes, he stuck. He was only 16 in 1865 when he opened that first shop, so he, could, he couldn't do it on his own. Leaky yeah. couldn't in those times. But, uh, yeah, that's where it all started, back in Manchester. Amazing. So you're coming up for, the business is coming up for 150 years, which is quite remarkable. There can't be too many retail businesses. or certainly, certainly aren't many others I can think of that have lasted as long as yours. Is, is being a family business, do you think, the reason that's helped you to, you know, the business to sustain itself that long? I think it has. I think that uh, the what you get from a family business is continuity of management, which you don't get in most other businesses. That uh, you see that chief executives last for what five years, sometimes mm-hmm. ten years. Uh, in our case, well, my son James has been now running the business for nearly twenty years, and I've been involved since nineteen sixty. Not running it all the time, but I think. Yeah. I think I probably did about 20 years uh, running it like James did. And yeah. that gives uh, a lot of, I mean, continuity can, can't always be a great thing if, if you've got someone who's leading it in the wrong direction. Sure. But it does help. It helps the colleagues, helps the customers, helps that consistency that the business needs to keep going in the long term. Often what happens with family businesses is, you know, second or third generation. I think it's often talked about third generation, the, you know, the business, the business fails. What, what is it ultimately at the heart of Timson's that's enabled it, outside of just consistency? What's at the heart of making Timson's the success that it is and enabling it to be successful, you know, year after year? Well, first, I mean, we didn't actually, we, we got to three generations. And then uh, before I managed to run the business, we actually went out of the family hands. And then right. uh, got taken over. We had a a, a, a fair size difference in the boardroom that led to a change of ownership. But right. fortunately, we got the business back. Um, I think that, I mean, apart from the consistency I've mentioned, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, 
if if you've got a business which is when I talk about a family business, I'm talking about a generation family business rather than uh, a lot of business these days are founded by uh, some inspirational entrepreneur who quite understandably wants to make his or her money out of it. And their aim is some some sort of uh, uh, s- selling on to uh, venture capital or floating the business or what, having an event that crystallizes the value of the business. But yeah. a family business like ours doesn't think like that. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're going from one generation to other. And so... As a result of that, I think it's fair to say that the college working the business are also part of the family. Yeah. And I think that uh, contract with the people who are working in the business makes a big difference. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're going to pay them a fortune, but it does mean you, you've got, they get much more job security and feel much more part of the business. Sure. And I think that's very important. We'll, we'll definitely come on and talk about that in a bit more detail. Obviously, we've been through a year and a half of uh, turmoil as a result of COVID and along with every other retailer, that's obviously had an impact on your business. But can you just talk about that? What has the impact of COVID been on on Timson? Uh, It was traumatic to start with, very traumatic. We suddenly found from within 10 days, went from running as we've been been doing a full tilt over 2,000 shops to having to close them all. Uh, And... We, they only opened up very gradually. We were initially we were losing two and a half million pounds a week. Fortunately, we started off with about ninety million pounds in the bank, and if we hadn't have been there, we would have had even more problems. Yeah. Uh, so we had to rush around getting um, bank facilities, um, working it all out. I mean, there was absolutely no doubt that uh, the chancellor's uh, package of measures, the furlough and the uh, the rate. Uh, not not having to pay rates for a whole year, yeah. the, the grants that came through, have made a massive difference. Yeah. Uh, but also, we learned a lot through the uh, through the pandemic. And in fact, we realised, like every business does when it's really up against the wall, you can actually survive on mm. lower costs. Yeah. And uh, last summer 2020, we had to really pull everything in. And we we now now run a much leaner business which is really doing very well yeah. and we found that actually we can run the business uh on slightly less less people uh sadly a few people disappeared more than a few people d- disappeared last year but yeah. those who are left tend to, to be those who are absolutely our superstars yeah. so we've we finished up now having a business which uh is now doing very well again, uh, and on slightly less people you'll probably notice in our shops, yeah. but they are all absolutely 10 out of 10s. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, I'm delighted that you've obviously uh, made, it, made it through a very difficult period and are, and are thriving again, um, and as you see, learned ways of uh, b- being able to work slightly differently with a slightly different uh, structure and model. Um it strikes me that you've always had, you seem to have a fairly flat organizational structure. Um, Cause I see, I know you talk a lot as, a, as an organization about the empowerment of people at every level within the business. Um, and that seems to be very much at the heart of, again, what enables you to, people in the front line who are serving customers to be able to make decisions are empowered, you know, to do the right thing for customers. Um, is it that flat organizational structure that really helps to facilitate that? Yes. I mean, it, it, think, think of our structure in two ways. First of all, we've got the field team who yep. are day to day out there supporting the people who serve the customers. Yep. And we run, we actually, I don't describe it as flat. Uh, for each 50 or so shops, we have an area team with an area manager, three assistants, and three mobile area team managers who go from shop to shop just right. in gaps and that yeah. team of seven people are there to support everybody who are out in the branches right. so we've got a very chunky area team yeah. uh, which is deliberately done so that the people who are in the branches have got nothing that gets in the way of them serving customers right. Right. and then and then the other thing to think of is uh we don't have what we call we try we, we like to think we don't have a head office. I mean people call it a head office. Sure. We, try, we try not to. But what happens outside of the branches is unlike is unlike a lot of other 
uh, ways our companies are run. Certainly at the centre, we, we work out the strategy, we decide where the, the investment's going to go. But what we don't do is come up with policies and processes. Yeah. That, because that's telling people in the, in the front line how to do their job. Yeah. We allow them to do the job the way they want to do it. Yeah. What the, the central functions are support yeah. functions, which are purely there to make life easier for the people on the front line. Right. That's what the job of the people at the centre is. And yeah. that's a very different concept. It's very difficult to get that into the minds of other businesses. I've tried. And, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, everyone nods when we talk about it. Then when they go away, they do it the way, the, the way they used to do it. A hundred percent. Well, I, th- I think, and I think it's great that you do that. And I think it's the lack of, it's the fear of giving up control, isn't it? And, you know, I think we, the way you talked about your, your office, you don't want to think of it as being a head office. And I completely get that. I've, I, a good friend of mine is a, a gentleman called Mike Logue who runs Dreams. And he's of a very similar mindset. And he calls you know, his office, their office, uh, bed quarters. <laughs> so obviously, okay. I don't know what the equivalent would be for you, but we'll, we'll see if we can think, we'll see if we can come up with a country or something up. But, but it's it's important because it's a mindset that sets the tone and, and, and enables you to, as you say, to have that sort of support structure that allows people on the front line to just get on and do their job. And and I think it's very brave of you to do that. And, and I think that's what other I think it's the right thing to do, but I think that's what other businesses struggle with. It's the kind of fear of giving up the control, you know, and, and actually truly empowering people on the front line to make the decisions that make a difference, you know, for customers. Yeah, well, it, 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 so, well, most businesses think that the head office is there to tell everyone what to do. Yeah. They, they, for some reason, think that they know much more about everything in the business and that of people on the outside. But in actual fact, the experts, the people who are doing the job, Totally they, they know more about than anyone else. So why not let them get on and do it? Exactly. Uh, and so it it actually, you finish up, if you're not careful, with someone in, who doesn't know as much as the people on the front line, coming up with a policy which tells them how to do it. And then it gets worse because then they measure them to check they're doing it the way they're meant to do it <laughs> instead of allowing us to get on with it. So yeah. uh, it's yeah. counter, it, it costs a lot of money and it makes matters worse. Yeah, so absolutely. it's not it's, it's not a brave decision as far as I'm concerned. It's just simply common sense. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's the it's the right thing to do, definitely. Um, you've also got a great culture in the business. How do you make sure you continue that when, when you bring new people in? How does that work? Okay, for a start, I described to you earlier about the area teams. None of those area teams have come from outside the company. They all started as an apprentice. Right. Now that makes a big difference because that saves us a lot of time trying to uh, teach people who come elsewhere that there's another way to run a business. Yeah. So they're all, and that pretty that applies as much as we can for those who are providing the support functions too. Although obviously, if we've got experts coming in with uh, IT skills, uh, accountants, uh, to some extent, uh, personnel skills, then they come from outside. But we. We make sure, first of all, that they're the right personality for us, that they, they they think in our sort of way, and that they understand what they're expected to do, they understand what the culture's about. Yeah. And then, when we haven't been able to do this over the last 18 months, we're about to uh, start with a vengeance. We have what we call a residential for everyone who joins us. Yeah. After a few months, they come for uh, two days to uh, Withenshaw, where we've just we're not during the, the uh, pandemic we've knocked down our training center and built a brand new big building we're calling the timson university it's called the right. nest the building mm-hmm. in there and mm-hmm. that's where they'll come to in in uh, groups of about 40 or 50 right and they spend these two days and basically they have a lot of fun they, we, they play games but in the process of having fun they learn about the company culture so yeah so very quickly people get the message and also the induction is leading in that way so we do a lot in terms of uh training individual people a lot more difficult when we buy a business that yeah. that that takes time and uh, we almost inevitably have to get in, uh, our people involved in running that part of the, of the yes. new business but yeah. uh, and then 
it's not just a question of people telling people once to keep the culture going. You've got to keep talking about it, keep doing it. And uh, so we're we're about to launch what we're calling our degree course in upside down management, mm. which is what Simpson University is there to do. So people go back and they keep finding out about it. Why we do it? How you do it? What being a great, great boss means? What creating a great team means? How you make sure that you do let people get on and do their job the way they know best. Yeah. I do. I have to say, I, I really genuinely believe that lots of other retail businesses could learn so much from your business. And I think that when you were describing, you know, about allowing people on the front line, the people with the skills who know best to get on with their job, I think the other thing that that your business model actually facilitates is for your business to be, although you're a national chain, for each of the individual branches to really behave more like an independent retailer. You know, because the people that are running those branches are obviously very close to their local and, you know, their own environment. They'll often know the people that are coming in on a regular basis. And I think you get a different level of service from independent retailers than you might do from a national chain. And I would imagine that's one of the advantages of, you know, the model that you've created and and empowering people to kind of run those stores themselves, essentially. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I'm always pleased when people... Miss, make the mistake of thinking we're a franchise business that it's right. been that everyone owns their own shop because I want them to feel that way. Yeah, uh, and there, there is no doubt that we do get. I mean, I get a lot of customers write and say, "I was in your shop in so and so, and I'd like to mention the person who served me." Uh, but I think if you let people get on with it and, and be in charge of their own shop, which is what mm. we truly do, uh, it's very good for their well-being too. They, they're in charge of their lives much Absolutely. more than someone who's just, just a cog in a wheel. Yeah. And you get the benefit of that. And, uh, and because you, you, you pitch them in and say, it's yours, then they take the responsibility much more seriously. Yeah, yeah. You, um, I, think it's, I think it's fairly well known, but if not, we, we should talk about it, um, that you provide an opportunity for ex-prisoners to, to rehabilitate themselves, get back into... A career. I, I'm I'm really interested to understand what the what the motivation for that was initially, and 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 how that manifests itself basically in reality. Well, everything, or nearly everything in business, despite the fact you might hear otherwise, is due to uh, a few uh, light bulb moments and a few bits of chance. And the uh, uh, our employment of people from prison was just that. It came because my son James attended uh, an event at uh, uh, Thorn Cross, which is a prison near Warrington, near us. It was a, uh, they were having a, a, a meeting in there. There was a couple of talks inside the prison and a meal. But also it involved a tour around the prison and James was taken around by mm-hmm. one of the inmates called Matt, uh, who impressed him so much. He said, well, when you get out, get in touch. I'll give you a job. Right. Uh, that was that was about 19 years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, Matt Matt is still with us, but uh, we also have about six out uh, 600 others uh, who who've joined us from prison. Right. Either, either either one or two not direct from prisons. One or two people who've been in prison heard that we employ ex offenders, and that, that's uh, got them to apply to us. But most of them uh, is us proactively going into prisons, finding finding people who've got our sort of personality yeah. and working out how they can come and work for us. Yeah. Uh, and the most successful is when they start working for us uh, when they are still in prison. So uh, I met one last week, actually, who and she she's coming, she's about six weeks away from the end of her sentence. And uh, she was, she'd been with us about ooh, 10 weeks. And every night she's back in her uh, back back in prison, uh, but each day she's coming and she's running the shop. She's she's a manager of the shop for us already, yeah. and uh, doing a great job. When she comes to finish her sentence, she's going to another part of the country, and we'll find a job for her there. So we've got we've been doing this for twenty years. So uh, we we've worked out what's best for us, what's best for them, and also what's amazed been amazing is the support we've had. The customers who approve of what we're doing, and also from the colleagues, we're absolutely key to this because they, especially in the first six months, it's their support of the uh, the people who've joined them from prison, giving them the support, not not 
not in teaching them how to do the job particularly, but to help them support them in the difficulties that you have leaving prison in terms of your home life, in sorting yeah. everything else out. Uh, yeah. And uh, anyway, it works. It works I, think really, really I, think I think it's absolutely amazing. I really do. Um, I would imagine, I mean, I'm certainly no expert on this, but I would imagine that the majority of prisoners who you know when they when they reoffend you know ultimately they're coming out of jail and they haven't got sort of opportunity that you're presenting to the right people with the right personality that are coming into the business and therefore you know the, the and there's not the, the sort of support network there to help find them work and give them the opportunities that, that that your colleagues are getting and that's why they ultimately end up going down the wrong path again and so you know you're having an, i think it's having it's obviously having an amazing impact on, on each of these individuals lives but you're also benefiting because you're getting very, very committed people who I'm sure are incredibly grateful and recognise, you know, the good that you've done for them and, and what that means for their life. So Yeah, and, and now we've been doing it long enough to find a number who've joined us through that route of going right up, uh, becoming area managers. We've got one of our divisional directors who joined us from prison. Uh, right. so it, but... After time, you've you've forgotten where they came from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the important thing is who they are and what they're doing now. Exactly. And uh, I mean, you mentioned how difficult it is for people and, and for people leaving prison, and that's reflected by the number of uh, about sixty-one percent uh, who leave prison uh, reoffend within two years and are back in prison. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a job, that goes down to about nineteen percent. Right. With us, our number is under two percent. I mean, wow. we just do not find people reoffending. We yeah. get obviously you get the one or two blips, but mm. they are few and far between. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can encourage other businesses to follow suit uh, and do something similar, and then we get that we get that number right down. Um, I get the sense that I, I don't know whether you set out to do this or not, but. I'm a believer that there's a big difference between, you know, having customers and having fans. And whilst I appreciate that, you know, the services that you offer, you might not necessarily sort of associate them with having, you know, people that are fans. I, I really believe that the level of service that you deliver and the experience that you deliver kind of moves people along that path. Do you agree with that? And is that something that you, you know, how, how do you achieve that, do you think, as a brand? How do you turn somebody from being a customer into being a fan? I mean, we, we didn't set out to do things that way. I mean, the, but although we did go go on the, what we call upside down management route, yeah. uh, as a way of improving uh, customer service. We, I mean, we reckoned, and I think this is true of most retail businesses, that the the best way to compete with the opposition is, is to give fabulous service. And uh, we thought the only, the, actually the only way to do that is to, is to give your people the opportunity to, to serve customers the way they know best. Otherwise, you can't, you can't deal with a difficult problem. And the, uh, so that's why we set out. That's what we set out to do. Yeah. What we probably hadn't realised at the same time was we were actually probably... Uh, embarking on a, a fantastic advertising scheme. Mm -hmm. We we don't spend any money on advertising. We don't have a marketing department. We don't do any of that. But in actual fact, now uh, our colleagues out there serving customers every day are our marketing department, good or bad. And uh, fortunately, it's a very positive field. I mean, I, we do have lots of things that go wrong. I know that. Uh, but generally... If someone talks to me, or I meet somebody I've not met, met before, and then like, where do you live? Or do you, do you shop with us? They'll say, "Oh, they talk about the people. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about what what the shop looks like or what the job was. They always, oh, I was served by X." And some people say, "How do you get so many great people?" Mm -hmm. And of course, it's very simple. That we just only pick people with the personality we think is going to work. I mean, we, we we want to have people who we rate nine or ten out of ten, and to get that you need to employ positive people yeah. who are who are keen to do the job, happy, get on with other people, and yeah. generally the sort of person who you would work, work, like to work alongside yeah. or to be served by, and that's all we do. We've been doing yeah. that for 20, 20 oh, years. It's common um, sense again, isn't it? So uh, yeah, so we've got no plans to spend money on advertising, but I think it's fair to say that we've. Particularly, actually, through the pandemic, 
actually when even when the shops were shut mm -hmm. uh we we got a lot of uh people who are saying how much they like the business so yeah absolutely so, yeah yeah. I, you, you've talked. You've mentioned a couple of times and about the upside down management <clears throat> model that you that you operate in the business, and I, I know what that is, and I talk quite a lot about it. But do you want to just maybe explain for the listeners what that that actually involves, what it, what it, what it is really? Right. Well, the the principle is what I say that we started off by saying if we're going to give a great service, we've got to give the people in the front line. Uh, the freedom to do the job the way they want. And uh, um, so I, I love that idea. And I set off with a great big, great enthusiasm 20 something years ago to do it. And I told everybody they, they got the freedom to serve customers the way they want, charge what they wanted, do what they wanted. And uh, I had a great campaign, used our newsletters, and put a notice in every shop saying, our colleagues in this shop have got the freedom to give you the customer's return, all yeah. that stuff. And went round, spent three months visiting shops. And, you know, it didn't change. Nothing happened. Yeah. Because I didn't realise that every time I visited a shop, the area manager would ring up straight away afterwards and say, don't take any notice of what John's saying. You work for me. You do as you're told. Right. So, that, that was problem number one. I had to yeah. iron out how the area managers did their job. So we came up with a whole area manager's guide, completely redescribed what the area manager's job was, right. uh, which was to support people, not yeah. tell people. Yeah. And we, so we came out with things like, no one is allowed to tell anyone else what to do in this business. Yeah. And, that, uh, and, uh, and we told just to help, we told the people in the shops who, just to give you an idea, uh, you you can charge whatever you want uh, and you can spend up to £500 to settle a complaint without talking to anyone else. So were two examples of freedom they've got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, that started to help to get when they got the area managers to understand what job I wanted them to do. And then I had to sort out the head office problem we talked about earlier and said, you from the head office could not tell people in the front line what to do. You're mm -hmm. there to help them do their job, not tell them what to do. So mm -hmm. when we put all of those pieces together, we, we, we discovered that the one thing that then got in the way was the fact that it only worked with the right people. Yeah. I wanted people with, with a great personality who understood what we're about. So put those three bits together, that's where you get the way we run our business. Right. So very simply, everybody, and not just people in the front line, everyone in whatever their job they do, they do their job the way they want to, they want yeah. to do it. Yeah. And a boss uh, can do whatever he wants, she wants, yeah. as long as they give the colleagues in the team the freedom to do their job the way they want. Yeah, and they're... That, and they're and as you said, they're there to support them, not to, not yeah. to tell them what to do. And that's a, a very different way of... Uh, Doing business from the, from, the, from the majority, but I think... Yeah, and, 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 you, and it's not a question of uh, sort of tailoring that to fit the old systems. It is a new way of running a business, yeah. and you actually have to do exactly what I say to make it work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you own a, a number of other brands in the group. I, I don't know whether everybody that's listening is aware of that. So you've got Snappy Snaps, you've got Johnson's Dry Cleaners, you've got Barbershop, you've got a watch workshop and others. Um, and you did touch on this earlier when you were talking about sometimes to acquire a business, you have to put your own people and get your own people involved in, in, in those businesses to sort of change the culture. How, how else do you ensure, uh, from a consumer point of view, how do you ensure or do you want to ensure that consumers know about all these other brands and your association with them? Well, we, we don't particularly plug the fact that Max Spielman is another one, which is a Tim, is a Timson business. In, right. in fact, uh, Snappy Snaps is a is a franchise business. So each one yeah. of those is owned by the franchise franchisee who's in right. there. We we've, yeah. we've changed that by concentrating more and more on support, which I've always thought was is a franchisor sh should do. Uh, yeah. But there's a bit of our culture in there, but there's also quite a lot of the individual owners' culture, uh, yeah. and I think. The other thing, frankly, I mean, it, it sounds a little bit harsh, but there's no doubt one of the main things that we do when we buy one of these businesses is uh, 
we concentrate on build, getting more of the people that we like and we say goodbye to the people who just do not get the upside, actually don't have the right values sure. To, sure. To, to work in a business like ours. Yeah. Uh, people who actually just want to turn up to, uh, to have something to do, we want to have somebody who wants to really uh, make, make a career out of their job. Yes, yeah. and make a difference. Well, I mean, I think that makes perfect sense mm-hmm. otherwise. You wouldn't be the success that you you know that you are as a business. Um, there's lots of things going on that are, other things that businesses are having to pay a lot of attention to at the moment, and not just pay lip service to in terms of you know how they, how they're going about addressing things like diversity and inclusion and social responsibility, which are I genuinely believe becoming increasingly important to consumers as well. What's your what's your approach to all of that? How do you what does that mean for you, and, and what are you doing about it? Uh, what we don't we don't have targets in terms of uh, we, either uh, the number of women or men. In fact, we've got it's straight. Whatever we do, we will always finish up in the shoe repair key cutting business, having a, a majority of men in that business because it's what it attract, attracts. And in the photo business, which is the next biggest part of the group, we'll always get more women than men. Uh, we we actually. Are getting. We, we have a number of our shoe repair shops that are run by women. Uh, we're disappointed that we don't actually have a female area manager. When it comes to the the the, uh, the central support facilities, they're just about equal. Uh, but we're not counting. I mean, the most in, I mean the most important thing is having some of the right personality. And one thing we have discovered is people who are the right sort of. Uh, we call them the right Mr. Man, the ones with the right Mr. Happy, Mrs. Keen, and so on. They come pretty evenly spread. If you concentrate on having the having the right attitudes, then that tends to tends to work. To find you get the right mix. Yeah, we've got a very diverse membership of our senior management team, which and that makes a difference. I mean, yeah. uh, both both. I mean, fairly equally, men and women. Uh, and we've got a good smattering of uh, different races through through the business, and uh, yeah. and that's good, and it worked well. And, and just just finally, uh, to ask you about you know your own perspective on other brands, you know, are there other brands that you engage with or you admire from the outside in um, as being customer centric? Uh, well, we've we've always had a sort of very close relationship with Richie Sounds, uh, Julian Richer right. is mate of my friend James and uh, yeah. I I read his book before I even started one writing any of mine and I thought it was it was a breath of fresh air the way he approached business yeah. um, I I certainly nicked a lot of ideas and admired pret a who've run into more difficulties in the last two years than most and I think they're yeah. going to find it tougher uh, I think I mean I go with Go, I probably learned more in my first few years in retailing from Marks and Spencers than anyone else. Who mm-hmm. uh, it's just sad to have seen over the last twenty or so years or more how how they they, they lost that edge. I got a uh, hint the other day that business might be getting a bit better there, and that, that would yeah. be great. Yeah. Uh, and also, of course, in similar terms, John Lewis, who we all learned quite a bit from at, at one yeah. time. Yeah. There are plenty of examples out there. I mean, we, 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 we tend a lot of our shops tend to be fairly close. If we're on the high street, we'll be almost certainly within a few doors from a Greg's, and we we we've got a fairly close relationship with them. In particular, I mean, they're one of the few businesses who have a very positive uh, uh, policy as far as employing people from prison. So they've got the same attitude there. Right. But but there's always I mean, there's. It's always worth walking around the high street, chatting to other people. You could, you're not, you're going to learn a lot more from other people than sitting in an office trying to come up with ideas on your own. Get out and about, and some of our best ideas, of course, not only come from competitors, but come from our own colleagues, uh, yeah. who uh, who do keep reinventing the business for us, which yeah. is great. Absolutely, and I, I definitely think um, too many too many businesses. I think I've lost you know, sight of that and the importance of getting into the stores, talking to customers, talking to colleagues, um, and getting out and about, as you said, you know, there's, no, there's well, nothing... I, I, I've got to the stage where my son James runs a business, and I'm 
if you remember the old uh, Are You Being Served Grace Brothers television thing, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm young Mr. Grace, the old man who comes in and says, you're all doing very well. I just, I just spend a day or so a week doing that, going around, chatting to the people, gives me a feel of the business. And I like... I fondly like to think that they like to see me uh, at my age. That's about what I'm good for, really. <laughs> so, John, I'm very, very grateful to you for your time, for your fantastic um, insight and, and letting us under the hood, get it under the hood of Timson's and what makes it tick and, and sharing, you know, everything that you've done with us today. I think it's great. And I know that our listeners will really look forward to, to hearing all about it. So thank you so much for your time and, and, and for joining me today. Well, thanks very much. Nice to talk to you. If you would like to know more about what we are doing at Customer Service Action, the platform where people can share their good and bad customer service stories and experiences in one impartial place, then please visit customerserviceaction.com. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you can be notified when we go live with future episodes. Thank you so much for joining us today on Customer Centricity with me, Martin Newman.